Okay? No more? You have anything else to say? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Now, it is very much a New England phenomenon, too, as it grows up in these places where a very new thing was happening. That is, people were taking the whole summers off. They were taking them off, and they were going back to these places by the shore, the old colonial towns. And no place is more intrinsic in that relationship between the center city office building and then the new shingle-style summer houses than Boston, and then the north shore of Boston. And, the, and, and from Boston, there's a railroad line that runs right up through Beverly, where this house on the right is, the Loring House, by William Ralph Emerson, who was a cousin of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And then beyond it, there's Manchester by the Sea, that I talked to you about last time. And so you've got a whole connection between the, the American skyscraper, and on the left, of course, is Richardson's Ames Building, the second one in Boston of 1886, and the Loring House of 1882-83, which is now beautifully restored and open to the public and a center of study and a wonderful place to look at the shingle style. A very, very beautiful house indeed. Now, this place is also in New England in its imagery. And if you look at the organization of that building with its rock, which is right back from the beach, those are the dry grass, salt grasses, the spartina along the beach. It rears back from the beach like this, just like a wonderful uh, painting of, of a wave, a nor'easter, by Homer just a few years later along these very coasts and farther to the north. It grows out of it. As I said last time, they might have been better off those houses if they'd been closed up tight like many of their models in the colonial in, in colonial architecture itself, like the Parson Capon House of the 17th century, not far from here at Topsfield, Massachusetts, where all the English gables have been sheared off. In the shingle style, they all come back one way or another, and closed tight as a ship. On the other hand, the shingle style architects were very aware of that, and they used colonial architecture in, in a very creative way. They saw it, say like the Parson Capon House, as a shape, a very solid archetypal shape, which could be manipulated and changed in a number of ways. At the same time, it was a symbol. It was a sign. It said colonial architecture. It said, we belong here. We've been here for a long time. All those things they were trying to evoke there by the shore. So you get a house like the one on the left, which is very important because it's published in England in 1883 and has a considerable effect, I think, on people like Voisey, Charles Voisey, CFA Voisey, who I'll talk about later in this lecture. Uh, and, uh, and it's called Shingleside, and it's by uh, um, a, a man named, uh, <laughs> whose name I seem to have forgotten, a little, Arthur Little, who later starts a very famous engineering firm that is run almost up to the present in Boston. And you see what he does. He takes the Parson Capon house, and then he blows it way up in size. He makes it really two floors taller. And then he cuts porches in underneath it. Then he adds a bay, a Chateau de Loire Bay, more or less, across the front, to be himself a bad thing for the Maristas, right in there. And then he has a living room inside, and the old rooms were small around the chimney, tight. Now they all break loose because they've got central heating, and American central heating is a very important part in this as well. Or if they don't have it, they're occupied only in the summer. So you don't need that. The fireplace becomes romantic, becomes English, really. It goes back into an ingle nook. The living room is two stories high. People look down upon it from above, from beyond a very colonial turn posts here, you have a two-story living room, which is expressed, I think it's out of focus, uh, Rene, Rene, can you fix this a little? Yeah, good. No, you had it better. That's better. You see, there's a two-story living room right there by a complete wall of glass, which is a bay like this, and these voids of the porches cut in, and the whole thing is opened up, becomes like a whole landscape. You can wander through it. It's very free. One space flows into the other in three dimensions. You really have to study it in section uh, as well. Now, I told you when this comes back, starting after 1959, when, when uh, uh, Venturi 
first begins to use the shingle style directly, people like Bob Stern, students of mine and of Venturi's like this, he takes a house like this one and he tries to make a modern house out of it. He, tries to, he really is deconstructing it, even though that word isn't invented for architecture for another couple of decades. But a house like this one at the right, you see there is the two-story living room or the round bay. There is the frontal plane of the gable roof. There are the porches and there are posts, but the whole thing is taken apart. And I think probably not too successfully, but it, it is typically deconstructed. Now, the, 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 the shingle cell architects themselves did somewhat the same thing. Here's another house by Arthur Little, also at Swampscott, Massachusetts. And look how much it's like Stern's house. That's to say there are several phases of colonial architecture which have been taken here, the front of the slope here, the side of the gable there, all stretched out on the side and stretched along like this into a new composition. It's a little like this, as if they, he'd taken, say, an old colonial house, one that was revered, the coffin house in uh, Nantucket, like that, and he takes the frontal slope, then he takes the tightness of the gable, but then the gable goes down here to a long salt box like that, and he has that out there then. Then he goes out and he has a smoking room here, which goes up and becomes really a lighthouse or uh, or, or windmill. And indeed, there are a lot of windmills along the Narragansett Bay. That time, as you know, it's a wonderful windy area. And, and Newport was crowned with windmills. And there's just one left on Nantucket. You can see over on the right. But he uses all those things really to make, again, a new kind of interior landscape space. The space stretches out from the entry. Well, there's a tight little music room to the left. And the hall has the fireplace and the stairs and the bays. It goes into a parlor, inglenook, light, open, onto the smoking room, and so on. The whole thing is, is just a continuity of spaces of all kinds of varieties. Very playful. They're having a wonderful time. Very playful, very eclectic, partly colonial, all modern, uh, in, in a way that's very special to them. Now, one way, starting after 1876, that they try to organize those spaces. The horizontality and continuity of those spaces is as follows. This is a house by McKinley White at Elbron, New Jersey uh, of 1880, 81. And it's not the one on the right, but it'll, it'll it demonstrate the point. You want to go out horizontally. So you have something they call a camoy and a rama, a beam and a screen. And sometimes they arch it. Sometimes they keep it flat, but they weave each room together. And when you go past, say when you go past the fireplace or an entrance, one room weaves into another. Now you also have, you notice, a floor pattern like this, which looks like something from the Dutch de style much later, say, of the, of the teens, of the 19 teens. But what all that really comes from, again, is from the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition of 1876. I remember I pointed out how, first of all, the exhibition made people love machines, and secondly, it made them love colonial architecture. See, it's, the, it's 76, it's the year of renewal. America's gonna start again, better this time, starting with its roots after 100 years. And so they, they look to the machine, they look to colonial architecture, and they look to Japanese architecture. And this is where Japanese architecture begins to make a direct influence on American. And eventually, in 1882, there's a very influential book by a man named F. S. F. B. Morse, Samuel F. B. Morse, called Japanese Homes and Their Surroundings. But already in 76, that architectural magazine, the American Architect and Building News that I talked to you about before, is publishing long articles about watching the Japanese workmen put the Japanese pavilion, which this is not, but the Japanese pavilion was like this, put the Japanese pavilion at the Centennial Exhibition of 76, put it together. And they describe how they don't use any nails, they peg it all together, how they have posts, kamoi and rama, in which each place is discreet, but each space opens out into the other, how there's a flattening of mats like this, very regular, but you see the Americans take all that and they make it continuous, 
They say it was junk, too, in a wonderful Western way, where the Japanese keep it so spare, just have a few things down here in the tokonoma like that. It goes out. They talk about how it goes out to the porch, how the walls are screens, which can slide underneath uh, the beam, thus how one space can flow into another or be closed. What they miss is what they don't like. But what you see so beautifully in Japanese movies and so on, you know the way these were intended to be used, where the great thing about that beam system is that each space is discrete. So in each space, you can have one wonderfully dressed samurai at rest with order. But then it also opens out. And it can close or open around the immovable, noble figure. Here, the Americans just feel the continuity. Just, just feel the opening. They want to stretch it farther. But it's the, basically the Japanese that are behind it. And McKinley and White are especially assiduous at working at this. Sanford White is a very beautiful interior designer, as you know. This is a famous dining room in an older house in Newport called Kingscote. And in 1881, he gives it a new dining room. You see, he picks up that Japanese system, but now he does it in elegantly detailed glass which would usually be by Tiffany. And he takes the mat system and then makes it small scale here on this rug, which I'm sure is made specially for it. And he weaves the whole thing together here with the beam. And you get that whole interweaving of spaces. You don't get now a plane of space with windows cut in it. You begin to get an interwoven web with the voids in between, which is, so, which is Japanese, which is very, very non-Western. And it goes on to little houses. It's also by McKinney White. It's called the Chilton House in Newport. You see you have the hall. Here it's small, but the same thing. The hall going out to the porch, little kind of ingle nook to one side, fireplace here. They use the ingle nook like a tokonoma here with a little decorative shape. This is a Japanese house of the 19th century. It's not really classic samurai as you would have had it in the 17th. It's not perfect, but it's what they saw what they liked. This is, this is what shaped 19th century taste. And indeed, finally, of course, that sense of all of it going out to the porch, which is so important to the shingle style, and which comes out, climaxes really, in, in the great porches at the Newport Casino. Now, the Newport Casino is 82, 83, and it really is sort of a kind of shopping center and social center and exclusive club for the great big new shingle houses that are being built in Newport. And so you have, see, we're here, you're looking at this right here. And there's a little a fountain there, and there are tennis courts beyond. Watch the focus. And here you get that wonderful cont continuity of that porch designed with the Japanese kamoi and the rama and the decorative details and the screens. And then out here, you have shops on the new main street here, which goes out to all the big houses down this direction and then entrance here, and you have a symmetrical facade, as you'll see in a minute. Now, on this side, it opens up. You get a Chateau de Loire tower like this in a totally different world back there. It's fascinating what that street facade is like. You see it's symmetrical off that frontal gable, which is now deep and dark, and it's over these wonderfully detailed brick walls, which are Roman brick, that is to say, narrow, in elevation, so there's slight, slight slabs like this, and they're very hard. And they're beautiful. Wright uses them too later. And then up above you have the shingle. Then the shingles weather this wonderful texture, and then this beautiful green somehow just so perfect, contrasting with it. But you see, they're really quite classical gables, like that. But they're set asymmetrically in the bigger gable, like this, and they're sliding down the street. It's a wonderful facade, very active, and a wonderful pull you in there to the courtyard. Then you get inside, and you go into that porch. You look back through the screen, and there's the Chateau de Loire. And these people are eclectics. It's English, it's American, it's Japanese, it's French. Francois Premier, all used very lightly. And with delight here, even with humor. It's really wonderful how good they are, how skillful they are, how well they draw. You can just see that. They draw all those things. And now they love the shingles. You see, the shingles are perfect. The shingles are really, they like nature, really. They, they weather this burnt toast quality, and they have this great texture. 
And they don't feel architectural, really. They feel like moss or lichen or grass. It's a, it, and, and you get this great space of the porch, maybe the most American of spaces, an Americanization of the whole Japanese instinct, here made very American, made very continuous and flowing. Now, when I wrote my dissertation about this, which I finished in 1949, I, I, I saw things still in a very stylistic way and probably in a very modern architecture way. That is to say, I saw this as a style that came to a head right here in the early 80s and then changed. And I saw it really as dying. Now, it didn't die, actually. It stayed alive right through until the Depression, in one way or another, as was and was revived, of course, later. But I saw it this way. Here is the set of the classic shingle style in 1882-83. And it's also in Newport. It's the Isaac Bell House. It's also open to the public now. And it's by McKim, Mead, and White. Now, you see, you've got everything. You've got the colonial right here. You got you can see it there, and you've got it here. You've got the Chateau de Loire. You have Chinese porch posts which actually come from a publication by Violetta Duke of a Chinese house. You have a very eclectic mix, all put together very skillfully around a very open and fluid plan, which has, again, the study of which you just see the tip of the roof over there, great big fireplace, light coming down here through the stairs right next to it, all the rooms opening into each other, very asymmetrical, very fluid, opening out to the porches, everything very free, here, and then all of a sudden, this is 82, 83, 85, 86, if you look at, look at the slide at the left, you know, look at this, you see, which is the HAC Taylor House, also support, by McKim, Mead, and White, and you see what's happened, all of a sudden, all the shingles, all the asymmetry, all the eclecticism is gone, and it's right down to really Adamesque or, or late colonial early 19th century design. The shingles are gone. You've got walls which are very thin, very thin, delicate clapboards painted yellow, white trim, very flat, very light, symmetrical, basically, except for the addition. And even more so, if you look at that plan, so free, so fluid, uh, oh, bang, all of a sudden you've got a classical 18th century plan, which is, in fact, uh, copied from the plan of an 18th century house. It's, it's a beautiful plan, wonderful fireplaces, and so on. But you see, it's all stiffened up, just like that. And I really felt at that time, probably under the influence of Gideon and so on, that this was an example of the reaction of the classical, which was killing, which was killing the, all the freedom, as I saw it at that time, of the shingle style. Now, it's not that On the one hand, these houses aren't really that different. That's to say, they may be symmetrical, they may not use shingles, they may use classical details, but they're very domestic in scale, they're very playful, uh, they're very skillful. And somebody like Bob Stern later, who was a student of mine, saw that and realized that it did go on later and that he himself could build this way now. He didn't have to deconstruct it, but he could try to just as build as well as he could in the shingle saw way and he could use classical details or something like classical details if he wanted. The whole thing could, could work together. Uh, which is true, so that all this, including a little bit of that classical reaction, is what from 1959 on created what I talked about in the first couple of lectures, created that revival of the shingle style of the American 19th century vernacular, which made uh, the new urbanism possible in terms of using, in terms of using the vernacular. For example, this is a group in uh, Newport of about 1884, and here's Bob Stern in the 1980s, and they go together, and the buildings go very well with each other, and each one is basically the same type, which is slightly varied. One becomes a gamble, one is a flat gable, one is frontal, one is on the side, but they all change and get along with each other because they belong sort of to the same idea, the same type is working here. And that, of course, I had no way of knowing when I wrote in 1948 that this would happen, that within 40 years, this kind of revival would take place. What I saw then, and still see with great excitement, 
is the way this turns into the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, and where it really turns into the work of everything we call modern architecture. For example, which becomes abstract, so that you get away from all uh, associations which are specific and have only your empathetic reactions to it, which is what the abstract painters and architects wanted, or even more than that, you have oceanic associations, not fixed to one particular thing. The brain is free to move and play. This is what Pollock and Klein exploited later. And it goes like this. It goes back again to Richardson, that sequence. And it starts with the great gable, the great frontal gable, which, as you saw, is the great work of the Watt Sherman House. You get that terrific continuity, the continuity of the, of the overhanging planes, the continuity of that rich surface, the continuity of space inside, the deep porch. It comes over you. It's almost going to break over you like a wave, like this. And it goes so beautifully with that painting by Homer, which is in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And the way it is in the gallery, I wish you could see it the way it is in the gallery, probably you have, you would swear it's coming over you. I mean, it doesn't stay in its space. It comes to your space. And it, that's partly because it's lipping over like that. And he, ah, rising like that. He calls it Cannon Rock in Maine. And the, the gable does the same thing. It's a wonderful, magical, primitive form. Very powerful, deep, calling up deep associations of being swallowed up, of the ocean, of the cavern. All of those things are there. People would get nervous when I talk about things like that in the 1940s. Architecture is supposed to be functionalist, like Walter Gropius, or technocratic, like Buckminster Fuller. But of course, it's much more than either of those things. And these images are all there. And they come forward, and people now recognize that, I think. And then you watch it develop. See, we saw it already in the Newport Casino in 82. All this becomes space, and it becomes black, void, deep, backward, and that wonderful archway underneath, which pulls you in, comes over you, fills your, your world. And then still McKinley and White, always McKinley and White. They really are the, along with Richardson, they're the ones. And they do the Cyrus McCormick House, which is like so many of these, I'm sad to say, is gone in Richfield Springs, New York about 1885, 86. And you see now it's all space going across. And it's another detailing from Violetta Duke from a Chinese house. And the space goes around the corner and it goes under it, but it's the big gable takes over the whole house now, the whole building, Cyrus McCormick House at Richfield Springs, New York, about 1885. It's coming at you. And then all of a sudden, their last one of this kind, though other people copy it, I found later, over and over again, right through past World War I, is the low house at Bristol, Rhode Island, which unfortunately was torn down by the owner. If it had lasted another 10 years, the, the, the trust would certainly never have permitted it to happen. But it's McKinley and White, too. And notice it's a year, two years, after the H.A.C. Taylor house. So they'd already done this classical revival house. But here is the low house, L-O-W, at Bristol, Rhode Island. And now, you see, you don't have the, all the porches cutting in, but you've just got to sweep and the bays inside are alive in it. You can feel it unfold. But the main quality is it just comes over you. Now, that quality is enhanced by the fact that, oh, uh, it, but the, the house is hurt, I think, by the fact that there's supposed to be a flat terrace, you see. So that great gable shape could rise over a plane like this. With it sloping away, it's a little awkward, but even more sort of engulfing as it rises there. Now, that was the house when I saw it published like that by Henry Russell Hitchcock in a book called Rhode Island Architecture of 1939. When I saw that, that's what told me I wanted to write about the shingle cell. They wanted to find out about it. And that was the house also when he read my book while he was in Italy in, uh, in, the, in 1957 that um, Venturi read. And then it's the, what, what, it's the house that started him with this Beach House project of 1959, it started the whole revival of the American vernacular. It goes right. So that house is pivotal uh, in, in every way. Now, the other thing about it is that that's where Frank Lloyd Wright started. And this is the house that Frank Lloyd Wright built for himself in Oak Park, Illinois, in 1889. He's already rapidly growing family in 1889. Now, Wright, as you know, had been born in 1866. And as I told you, 
uh, earlier, uh, later when he was marrying Ojulana, the dancer uh, from uh, Macedonia, wherever she was, that he took two years off his age. She was a lot younger than he was, and he was in Paris. So he kept saying later he was born in 68, but he was born in 66. Then he told everybody he lived with his father and mother, and his mother threw his father out, and he became the man of the house. He writes about that. I'll talk about that more later. He's in charge. He's Oedipus boy in charge there. And he runs the house and so on, according to him. Then according to him, he goes to the University of Milwaukee for a couple of years and takes a lot of engineering, but he only went there for a term, and all he took was French. He didn't take any engineering at all. He made it all up out of his head. But he came, and he worked for Sullivan, and he'd showed Sullivan some drawings, some of them those Celtic interlaces I showed you before, in 1887, when he was 21. He, later, he pretended he was 19. And uh, Freud told a lot of lies about his early youth, too. It's curious. These great late 19th century people all lied about their development, which is very wise, I think. It's better not to let anybody know what really is moving on the inside. In any event, uh, and he gets the job, and he makes a little money, and he builds this house for himself in a park. And he turns that to, to this model now the mo of the frontal gable. Now, it's not the model of a great big house like the low house that he turns to. It's of a much smaller house like this. And this is his model, as you can see it right here. This is a house called the Kent House at Tuxedo Park, New York, by Bruce Price. Now, Bruce Price was doing this job for Pierre Lorillard. And Pierre Lorillard probably has killed more people than Maxim, who invented the machine gun, because he's the one that made, was the big cigarette man. He's the one that made cigarettes, absolutely de rigueur, all over the United States before that, smoked a lot of cigars. And after this, is all cigarettes. Pierre Lorillard is a big tobacco man. And he wants to have a special kind of community, which he calls for honeymoon couples, in Tuxedo Park, which has sometimes been in New Jersey and sometimes in New York, it's up to Hudson. It's a very wild site. That's important to remember. With a lot of ledges and a lot of brush and forest. And he wants these to be sort of rustic cottages. So you get this small house, frontal gable. Uh, notice how you have a, it's really central here. That's symmetrical. But in this publication of it, in a magazine called The Builder in 1886, he does it from this angle. And Wright takes it and builds his house on that angle, as it were. He has his terrace will all be here on one side, and the entrance to the house is over here. But he has the frontal gable, and he has the half Palladian motif right here, and so does uh, uh, Price up there. Now, on the other hand, Price built more than one house at Carl Gables at, uh, at Tuxedo Park for Laura Lott and the other people. And here's another one which Wright also used. Here, this principle of condensation is coming into play. He uses partly this and partly the Chandler House at Tuxedo. And you see what he does at the Chandler House, they have bays under the gable, but the gable's at the side. But he turns it and he puts the, he borrows that motif and he puts the bays here under the frontal gable. And way up here, he has a window which has two windows like this and a panel in between and the thermal window here. And that's what Wright has here. Now here, there are three windows. But originally, when Wright designed it, there were just these two, because there was a bedroom right here. So that was also a panel, just like that one, when he originally had it, and then a thermal window up above. So we have, in the end, a kind of semi palladian motif. But that still is up on the third floor, and Wright's only on the second. So there's another house, the Van Buren house by Price, which is a weird little house. It looks like Maybeck, or a, a, a German, uh, expressionist, looks like a mouse, it's very odd, but nevertheless he does bring it down on the second floor and he has the Palladian motif complete as you have it here. Now another thing about this house is this. You remember I talked about how Jefferson developed the cross-axial plan and this is the, these are the first plans for the first Monticello about 1770 as you remember and then I said how this house, this is the Kent house. It's the first one I showed you. This is the plan of the Kent house. And it's a very good cross axis. You can see clearer maybe than Jefferson's. So working out very well. But the porch enclosed, notice, the porch is enclosed by the frontal gable. 
with the columns with the posts on the side. Now, right, we'll pick that up later, that cross axis, but right here, he doesn't do it very clearly. I think he has it in mind, but I think he doesn't do it because the lot line is right here. He's got no room. He can't really push it out. But he does have the entry, and it's really fascinating. See, he's beginning to move into realms that are different from the shingle style, but he wants a big shingle style stair. And it takes up all the space. And that bothers him later. He once said to me, whoever saw a beautiful staircase? He does the stairs, taking up the whole space. But what he really loves is the fireplace. It's right back there in the heart of the house. And he talks about how he loves to feel uh, the fire burning in the heart of the house. He says, a feeling that came to stay. I talked about that before. That's a colonial revival feeling, too, that we talked about. And this is the way it looks restored. And I say restored because this is the way it ought to be. This wonderful, gentle color. Uh, someone talked about the autumnal colors of Wright and Sullivan, too, as I'll show you next week. Uh, and the, the gentle yellow corn, colors of the harvest, somebody called them. And in, in the very middle, the fire burning here in the heart of the house. And Wright, Wright already was starting to be one of the great Japanese print collectors. These aren't Japanese prints. Well, this may be here. And later, he has a great collection of Japanese prints, and he deals in them. But he really doesn't have any space for paintings except this little area above the dado, like this. And later, he won't let any paintings be in there. But he, it's, it's very, and I think you can see how, how really, how disciplined it is if you look at it, and it's much less attractive, but photographed the way it was for so many years. Where this is the way modern art, art architects saw it, the way people like Gropius and so on, so you see it looks like the style. It looks like modern art. It's no more glowing. It's white and black and stripped. It looks like, again, it looks like the style. But that isn't the way it originally looked. But nevertheless, that's the basic bones. Now, you see what he's doing. He's using the Japanese system. And even more, those, look, those planes really are made to look as if they could slide, more or less. Even more, he, he, he picks up a Japanese model. Notice what he does. He, uh, he abstracts it. He takes away a lot of the detail. Of the small, all the decorative detail, he abstracts it. Already, it's more classical, his work. And notice what he does. He puts a classical dentals. He puts big, big scale classical dentals along here. So it's very, very classical feeling in that compared to the Japanese house or compared to Stanford White at Kingscote, which is so decorative. And all the wonderful little play of glass. It's really lovely, but Wright gets rid of all that. And you look at the writer, it looks very impatient. He talks later about he only wants to use things that come from the lumberyard. And you can feel that. In a way, it's impoverishing the whole thing. It's stiffening it up, making it harder. It's really hard compared with this, which is so gentle. I mean, I mean it's hard to over-appreciate the skill which, which he puts all these delicate different scales together. But Wright is disciplined. Now, where does he get that? And you see it even if you look at his house with all the, the backgrounds we talked about. That is such a clear triangle. And that is so clear right there. It's a very classical form. You feel deep underneath. You feel the temple underneath much more than you do in those of the people he was imitating. And he gets it here. He tells us about his autobiography. He read a book by a man named Owen Jones called The Grammar of Ornament which is of 1856. Now, Owen Jones was famous for conventionalization, which we would call abstracting. Now, Jones's book becomes the Bible for all the institutes, design institutes that grow up in England then, to make their wallpapers and their other exportable art objects compete with the French. And the French, they say, are lascivious. They have rosebuds and imitation of nature and all kinds. You shouldn't have that, John says. This is English Puritanism. The wall is flat, so the pattern should be flat. It should be geometric. Everything should be conventionalized, hard-edged. And that's what Wright liked. That's what he wanted. That's, that's the sense that he grew up with. Now, he also tells us that he read Ruskin. 
and everybody read Ruskin, but like a lot of people who read Ruskin, it's hard to tell where Ruskin figures in their own forms. It's hard to see them. He, he's a different, he, he's a feeling rather than a set of specific recommendations. But Ruskin hated this Owen Jones stuff. And in 1859, he published a book called The Two Paths. And he said one path was Owen Jones's, which led to perdition. He said it led to Hinduism and death. And the, the mutiny had intervened, 57, 58, in between. So that's why he's nasty about the Hindus. It doesn't read very well today. But now that he says it should be nature. He takes a pattern from a painting by Botticelli, and he does this drawing. He says, this is the kind of decoration you should have, not this, which is inhuman. And he proposes in Stones of Venice, he proposes handling an arch and so on like this, with details derived from nature. And you see it looks quite Sullivanian. It doesn't look like right at all. That's what's going to make the beautiful Morris wallpapers and so on in the Ruskinian way, but not right. That's not what Wright wants. He wants abstraction. Now, another thing that gives him that classical sense and that sense of abstraction at the same time is uh, the writings uh, of a man named Friedrich Froebel, F-R-O-E-B-E-L. And Froebel is really very important. He's a Prussian. And in 1828, he writes a book called The Education of Man. Now, that man is significant, too, because it's sexist. It means males. And it, it's all about a dialogue between the mother and the son, which is, and not the girls. The mother and the son. Strange. 19th century is a very strange time, believe me. I mean, that's why Freud has to grow up at the end of it to uh, find out what it's all about. Uh, and anyway, and in this, the mother is supposed to give the son when he's less than a year old, she's supposed to give him a ball of yarn. And that ball of yarn is supposed to symbolize the world and the mother's breast all at once. The child is supposed to have it in a box. He's supposed to take it out of the box. He has a string on it. He can do all kinds of things with it all day long. And when the day is over, he puts it back in the box like that. Really wonderful. Then he hides it back in the rectangular box. Now, this is only the first so-called gift that a verbal child has. And he has a series of gifts through his sixth year, at which time he's expected to go out into the world. He's past the mother's care. And by that time, he's doing very classical buildings on the system. The system is like this. See, he goes from this. And this would be about the third gift. The child would be about two years old by this time, maybe. You get beautifully carpented square blocks, blocks. And in each gift, you get very few. You don't get a lot. So when you start to make plans with these, you leave the edges open, the way Wright will do later. And, he, and you see, they make very classical-looking constructions, very blocky, very construction. And, and Wright says this is what he loved, because he felt when he worked with these that he was designing the world, not representing it, that he would be doing with Ruskin, you see. Now, there again, there's the modern architect. He's making the world. Design. He's the, he's the maker, the, the master here. It's like, uh, it's like Dr. Faustus. And it's, it's German and, and so on. Now, Froebel is the founder of the kindergarten. And he has a great following in Germany. And when those intellectual middle class Germans come over in 1848 and come down the St. Lawrence and they're fairly plush seamers, well, all the poor Irish are, are dying of cholera on the sandbanks up there, which is described. They come to the Middle West, and they bring this with them. Now, Wright claims that he doesn't know this until 1876. And he says, again, it was at the centennial. His mother discovered this writings of Froebel, and he began to work on it. But I doubt that, because he was, the kindergarten was big in the Middle West by the time Wright was growing up in 1866. And, and I think he knew it earlier. Again, why he's making it later, I don't know. I think he wants to connect it with a great national event. And the other thing that's interesting, too, in the 1880s, right at the height of the shingle cell, women uh, campaign very effectively to get into the system, the mother and the girl, the father and the girl. And it's very interesting uh, literature, if you're interested in gender studies, about how women attack this male-dominated mummy and baby, mummy, and little Oedipus uh, syndrome. In any event, this Wright says it makes him feel he's designing the world. So for example, when 
he builds this house on the quiet. He's working for Sullivan. He wants to make some extra money. He needs it badly. In 1893, he does this house, the Blossom House in Chicago. You notice what it's like? The windows are square. It's very uncompromising. He repeats the Palladian motif. And it's more so when you realize his model is the H.A.C. Taylor House. Is that lovely, delicate, clear plane, beautifully detailed H.A.C. Taylor House by McKinney and White, where you have all Stanford White's delicacy and sort of civilized gentleness. And Wright makes it, look, it's a very awkward building. How awkward that is, the repetition. But the discipline, the intensity, you're going to repeat it. It's going to be straight geometric, is for brilliant. And it's classical uh, in that sense. And it's very much a Frank Lloyd Wright. Here in 1893, he does this drawing. I'm sure he de designs this portico uh, for Sullivan in the transportation building at the exposition. And it's dark and rich and really rather Ruskinian with that basic Celtic background that we talked about before. But on the quiet, he enters the competition himself in 1893 for a museum in Milwaukee. And here he goes completely classical throws out all that Celtic stuff, and every bit of ornament is gone. It's very abstract. It's very stern. Now, the model he uses is the model that all those classicizing architects used at the fair. And that's the model that you see it here by Atwater in Machinery Hall, the great big most important building at the fair. We have a central pavilion with colonnade. Then you have a long portico on both sides with colonnades and pavilions at the end. And notice this one is down flat. Wright's is up here with a basement below it, and that makes him more faithful to the model, because the model for that type is French 17th century. It's Perrault's, P-E-R-R-A-U-L-T, as you know, Perrault's east front of the Louvre, the one that faces toward the slums of Paris, like a great line of cavalry protecting the palace here. And this is uh, 1870, and you see there is the system. There's the central uh, pavilion. There are the long colonnades, and there are the pavilions on the side, and there it's up raised up above. Now, notice, however, how Wright is much more abstract than Perrault. Perrault doubles his columns. Wright won't. Single, bang, 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 like that. Perrault allows slightly rounded on the east. Not at all, right? Like this. Right? Perrault permits itself an arch in the center. Not right. It's crossed like that. Absolutely abstracted already, and very classical, very stern. Uh, here, now, now, when the, the last gift that the boy gets, he's supposed to get it his sixth year, he's ready to go to school, so he's able to build a, a fine European facade for himself. See, here's his front as he goes off to school. It's fixed, clear, symmetrical. He's formed. He's ready. It's his shield. Huh? You feel that. Now, when right does this building for Sullivan in 1891, the Chandler House, Ch Charnley, the Charnley House in Chicago. Some of you have seen this, haven't you? It's gorgeous, isn't it? It's remarkable, yeah, how good it is. It's really much better than it looks here. The interior is just um, beyond belief if you look up the staircase there. And this is kind of an afterthought part. I'm not sure whether it's added later or done originally, but, so, but the house is this. You see, it looks a lot like that. Hard cut windows. Blocks, very classical. Also, it has a more definite model, which is also a classic model, an abstracted classical model. And that's Claude Nicolas Ledoux. This is a project by Ledoux of the late 18th century, a romantic classic building. And there you see it's basically the same building. Pavilions on both sides, one hard window. Then you get to the center. And Ledoux uses a colossal, unfluted colonnade, as he often does. But Wright won't use a classical one. He can't use that. So he has a Sullivanian. This, Wright did the whole design of this, we know, from Sullivan himself. He does a Sullivanian portico up here. He has to have an entrance. And he makes this curious thing that looks like a mask. You can see here. Now, what is that? Well, if you see it, as you look at it like this, you can see it. It looks like, a, like as it were, a nose, two eyes. And it's champing down on the pavement. And really what it looks very much like are the 
Maya masks that were available to him in publication, a lot of them, by this time, by 1890. For example, look at this one especially. So curious with this one, for some reason, it has this little hooded thing over the eyes, exactly where the curtains are pulled there against the sun, and then it goes down, champs down here with the teeth, and it tear, brings down here into the thing. And, and I think he wanted something, you see, that wasn't classical, but that nobody knew what it was. That's the whole point. It would look original. Nobody would know that was Maya. Who would know that? It actually took a graduate student to catch this in about the 1980s here. And th th there it is. Now, another good source for Maya stuff available to write was a, a book by a Frenchman named Desiree Charnay. And it was called Les Anciennes Villes du Nouveau Monde, The Ancient Cities of the New World. And it was brought out in 1886. And it was about the Usimacinta area of the Maya, classical Maya territory. And the drawings were like this, whether they're by Charnay or somebody else, I'm not sure. I think by Charnay himself. It's either kind of wonderful. They show a temple, uh, its base is covered by foliage. They're starting to excavate. Time has worn this away. Originally, it was a flat little. You get the massive mansard up above, three-lobed voids here in the front. And, and it was paid for, the book was paid for, by Pierre Lorillard. Lorillard, that's the same one who hired Bruce Price at Tuxedo. This is 1885. And at Tuxedo, you can see the first drawings that come out of Price's office for these little honeymoon cottages. You'd swear that the same draftsman did them. You'd swear they got Charnay or somebody to do that drawing there on the right. And like this, you see it's frontal, and it's up a stairway, and they make it be as high like this and as frontal as possible. And indeed, the building that he did for Lorillard himself is even more direct, because if you look at Palenque restored the way it's supposed to be, Palenque is all, often been, the imagery is connected there as of a great snake. It winds not far from the river, like you can feel it come up, come out. Is that it originally that concrete and masonry uh, great mass here had a flat level. And this is uh, erosion, that's decay. But here's the house that Price designed for Lorillard. And he gives him the arch. But it's the same thing. He has the, he has the uh, mansard roof. He has the three lobe here. He has the deep void in the middle. And, he, and it's on a rise. And it's as Maya as you can get. Now remember, Wright used everything about Price in 89, except the Maya stuff. That wasn't there, but now he's using it. And a wonderful brooding mask. Look how black those eyes are. And it's interesting, uh, Riley at the Museum of Modern Art, when I talked to him about this a long time ago, said he found a little drawing when they were putting the most recent Wright show together in which a little piece of tracing paper, Wright had this, and above it he'd drawn tentatively a little pediment. He wanted to see if he could also put a classical. And he decided, no, no, it's got to be more Sullivanian than that, I guess, and he didn't do it. And you can see it here. This is a typical serpent doorway. It's coming like this opening like this, fangs like this, eyes, great mouth. That's really what you've got pretty much over there. Then Sullivan, in 1893, finds out about right moonlighting, doing all those houses at night. And he fires them, throws them out. And they don't speak again until very touchingly just before Sullivan's death. And, and, and then, so Wright's on his own. He does the first house that he wants everybody to know, that's me, that's my house, this is my statement. Here's the young architect. So what does he give you? He gives you the mask, right in the face. It's the Winslow house, you see, right in the middle. It's the Winslow house at River Forest, Illinois, of 1893. And it's not only that mask, but he, he's got everything he knows. For example, he makes the lawn as much like a great French parterre as if he had hundreds of yards here. As, as he can, he didn't, won't just have a lawn. And then right inside this door, Winslow House, just inside that door, you get inside the door, and even closer, really, than this, there's something totally different. There's a Brunelleschian arcade, like this. And you see the scale. I mean, you see from this what the scale is. A human being, this is like Johnson's wonderful pavilion in his glass house garden. Too small to stand up, and it just, you can just barely stand up in that. 
tiny, and it's tiny scale. And there's the fire burning in the heart of the house. Right away, it's as if you'd come in on some primitive altar right away. And the plan shows you how close it is to the entrance there. But it's right in the heart of the house. Then you also see he has an overhanging roof. And this is very Maya to have separation elements like this. But notice, you don't see anything there. There are only three windows, but it looks like a void. And that's, you should see, that's because there is an uh, ornament there which is black and absorbs the light. And the thing overhangs it, and the roof looks as if it's floating. So he's doing that above the heavy block. And you see here it comes out like this. Whoop, the fo just went out of focus horribly. Got to watch it, Rene. I don't know what's the matter with that machine especially. Can you bring it back a little more? That's worse. Bring it back. That's better. I don't know. Anyway, this is low. on the first floor. The roof goes over it above, so there's that void there. Here, the roof comes back like this, and picks up, goes out like that, so it hovers. So that in front, the shadow is very strong. Anyway, you see it like this, and it's enhanced. It's typically Sullivanian use of ornament to get an architectural effect. Here to make it float. And when you get around the side, you see they really do seem to float out those planes. He really does seem to begin to want to do what he talked about in his autobiography is wanting to do he wanted to break out of the box for horizontal continuity out of the box into space. And it takes him a long time, all through the 90s, his 90s, he works on it. For some reason, he won't have all glass there. He'll just have windows and then some other detail, all kinds of things. You can trace it in his work. Until finally, he does it in 1899 to 1900 within the River Forest Golf Club. And you see what he has there? He has, like these, he has to have a hip roof. He can't have a gable. Gable would be wrong over this. The hip comes down and gives you a feather edge. So when you see it from the ground, it seems to float over it. It's all glass underneath. It goes right around the corner. And it refuses the corner. And it goes back in there, and it floats. Now, notice the partee. This is the second edition of it he did. This is the one that was, he did in 1900. You have this wind coming in, and then you get this larger place of gables where they intersect. Now, you can see he's got a direct model. And that model is English. And it's a building called Broadleys on Lake Windermere in the Lake District in England by C.F.A. Voisey. And you see you've got the, the hip, much higher than Wright's, but it's the hip roof. You get this continuity coming into the larger area here. There's not glass here, but there's a deep shadow. A deep shadow here, but the, here there is glass, all glass, at this place near the entrance. So the, for the first time, and then he picks that up right away here. Instantly, he picks it up. And you see it here in Voisey. Now, on the other hand, you see what Wright does with it. Wright makes that gable very low. And so that I, I know a very ignorant person Actually, a historian, but he didn't know anything about Wright, wrote about how Wright always used flat roofs in this period. Well, he doesn't use flat roofs, except on the office buildings, a couple of them, that's all. He uses low hips, try to prevent them from leaking. They leak anyway, but nevertheless. But, so, but from below, you see the hip can float forward, and you see a gable would be fighting it. And finally, he brings it all together in the Ward Willits house in Highland Park, Illinois, of 1902. He designs it in 1900, but it's not built till 1902. And I showed you this before, where you see he has a first floor and a second floor, but like Palladio, he subordinates the second floor, so you don't feel two things, you feel one thing, which refuses the corner and interweaves spaces, which they interweave behind it, like this, and the shadow by the roof with the refusal here and all the glass, so the whole thing seems to be hovering. And it's really, you might say, we saw how close this was in basic parti to Jefferson. But now it's gone way beyond Jefferson, you see, to what is really Japan. And that's interesting, too, because if you see the way he uses these elements, you see how thin the roofs are, as you see them from below, and how they do seem to float, and how he does refuse the corner. Now it's all interwoven. But you see also behind it, if you contrast the Jefferson with it, you get the great Japanese uh, Buddhist uh, temples with almost the same business that Wright uses with the stripping and the paneling, but big scale, big columns. The roofs become majestic. The roofs are very important symbolically. They're the great mountains. That are Wright. Wright has no such symbolism. The roof is just, he wants it to be a plane, wants it to float. 
takes all that a lot of glory and danger and terror there is in the Japanese, which is not present quite in the same way in the much more domesticated right, but it's much more like the little Japanese prince. And he was collecting like mad by this time. And of course then, you can see how if you take a nice shingle style house by an architect like Wilson Eyre in Philadelphia, how he could take the windows, bring them right around the corner, but he's got a gamble above it so you feel the volume, you don't feel it float. He doesn't liberate the space. He doesn't break the box. He holds the box as held, even though the window goes around the corner. And you can see how far he's come from. Richardson, the shingles are all gone. Ryan won't use shingles. He wants it abstract. He wants it largely at this time. He wants the stripping, and he wants the plaster. He wants the stucco. He wants it abstract. He wants it interwoven. He wants you to feel the skeleton. It's almost like a six dial coming back to feel the skeleton into weaving. He doesn't want the surface. So you see how incremental the development has been, which all the great things in architecture seem to go piece by piece, piece by piece. You don't learn everything in school and then come out and do it. Brand new thing, which is the Bauhaus idea. It grows from person to person working closely in relation to each other. But it's, now it's, a, it's really a wholly different thing. And the plan, of course, I talked about before. Now he pricks up Jefferson and Price is cross-axis, but what a cross-axis it is. It really, fireplace in the middle, going out to the kitchen and the dining room and the living room and the dining room here. I talked how beautifully it uses the American lot. There's the rectangular lot. Here's the sidewalk. The street is still a friend, so you open out to it. Dining room opens out to it on this side. This side is given to circulation. You bring your car, your carriage in there. This side is the private garden. You use the whole lot. Each quadrant has its use. It's really marvelous. It's a maximum expansion according to the real estate situation, according to the urbanistic situation of where the houses are placed on a typical American lot. And it's all fluid. And more than this, as you are pulled in there in those low dark spaces, and then are led to flow from space to space and go toward the light, out there toward this. It's, you see how different it is from the English house. For example, from Voisy. Here's Voisy, Lake Windermere. And it's the, the wonderful English thing that each room is separate. It has the big hall, in the way like the shingle cell, but the small doorways, each one is a little microclimate depending on its fireplace. And almost to this day in the English house, it's really wonderful because you put a lot of clothes I you lie there in your skivvies with a beer can in one hand like this because the heat, you see, this is, this is central heating making all that possible. But here you have just the fire. So you get the mother and the children close in like this, drinking tea to keep warm, microclimate. You get out here and it's freezing. You rush across another warm place. So it's kind of an adventure to live in the house. You have to be dressed. It's, it's wonderful, really. It's, it makes you love those hearts and the sense of the English house. Believe me, the sense of love and closeness is just fantastic. But the American, you see, it's like the American railroad carriages. It's all open. It's all free. The other thing is this. If you go into one of those rooms by Voisy, like right, it's low, and, uh, and the furniture scale to the architecture. But at the same time, you can tell what it is, what kind of furniture it is. It's a room. If you go into the right, it's not a room anymore. It's not colonial anymore. It's not Romanesque. It's not French. It's not British. It's a cavern. It's an archetypal thing. It's abstracted. All the furniture is exactly abstracted to it and to its structure. You don't say, this is that kind, this is that. It, and it's, it's dark as you go in there. And all of a sudden, you see, it becomes abstract. That is to say, you cannot have associations with different things. It's only an empathetic reaction to the place and an overall association to the sense of engulfment, the sense of being, of being warm and, and protected. Now, the color, again, has a lot to do with that. This is the Walter Mays house in Grand Rapids. Not one of his great houses, but beautifully restored. This is the color. You see how quiet it is. And now he's hiding the fireplaces. Pretty soon you won't ever see these at all. He's hiding the staircases. Get them out of the way. He doesn't like it because he wants it all in the horizontal. He doesn't want any of this stuff going up and down. He wants it all in the horizontal like this. And also, 
You see it here in the dining room. Now the other thing is this. The, the psychiatrist going up at this time, especially Jung, say, following Freud, talks about the house as the image of woman. And that's obvious enough. Uh, engulfment, protection, most of all the mother, maternal. But Wright's not that simple. Wright is also paternal. It's marriage he's talking about, not just archetypal. It's late 19th century nuclear family. It's that late 19th century nuclear family that Freud said he had to un un unweave the family romance of to find out what was wrong with its people who were produced by it. Imagine it's a totally different system before that. Before that, if you were very poor, you were working like a dog at eight years old. You're already a, a, a grown up. If you were rich, you were leading troops. High, clear voice at age eight, nine, ten. Babies. Also, you're grown up. Not at all. In the 19th century, you begin to be a child forever, like most of us. And he, you go on and on. You have the nurturing of the family. You have the father and mother. You're not, you don't have really all the aunts and the uncles and all that that they used to have in Europe in the same quite way. And everybody's problem rolled into everybody else. And everybody makes each other nuts. Okay? Largely, that's what Freud said. That's what happens. And uh, look at Wright's upbringing. Father kicked out. Mother printing all her love on him. He's the man. Anyway, here's the father, you see. These, in these houses, these people, those kids had to eat three hearty, stupefying meals every day and they had to sit up straight. They a, and they had to stand up and use their things properly. Look at it. Discipline. The father sitting on. So it's really male and female. It's kind of moving that way. And you see, it has a colonial background with that sense of a colonial house. Here's the Parson Capon house again. How much it's like this house, which is the Martin house in Buffalo of 1904. You get the big fireplace. You get the low ceiling. You get the exposed structure. You get the uh, furniture at the scale of the building. And you, so you get that sense of there's the hearth. There it's all one. There it's peaceful. There, there you're safe. But at the same time, you see on the right, it's sliding out, sliding away. It's also expansive. It's opening out. And more than that, too, he tells you, this family is well knit. It's put together. It's integrated. It's going to hold like this. Because, for example, everything works. For example, the, the piers that support the structure are in four. And they contain the heat and the libraries and the lights. Everything's in there. Then the plan. We're here looking at this fireplace like this. It's a big interwoven scheme, you see. Look at those. Wonderful four piers. Frankly, uh, Louis Connell picked this up later. And it goes out across that lot. One, it's a big lot now. It's a big house in Buffalo. It goes out to a summer house there, in guest house over there. But it's using the whole lot, using the whole place. And the whole thing is interwoven. And when you get outside, you see that's what you've got. You've got, watch the slide, watch the focus. You get the nurturing uh, plan coming out. The Chavanet are strong, supporting it. Talk about male principle, female principle, marriage, which is what he's talking about. Which is really, in this sense, the new institution of his day, the nuclear family, which we all take for granted, but which was new in the 19th century. And there you get it dark. It's like a temple. It's like a temple to marriage. That's what it's about. Because it's so abstracted, you see, you can't say Romanesque. You can't say colonial. You don't have any of that kind of association. You have only what you feel physically, empathetically about this support and this enclosure, which he wants it to be peace for the children and discipline for the children. Exactly what he wants. Very Frobenian, very kindergarten. You see, with Richardson, maybe you could say, what's the focus, Dave? You could say the house, you know, symbol of woman, gentle and closing and so on. But you see, this is a stern temple, stern that you have there. Now, he does have a room in that house where you say, oh, that's Hestia. That's all female. That's the hearth. This wonderful room where everything is rounded. And again, you see you have an arch, which is not, you can't say it's Romanesque or anything. It's just, it radiates energy like this, like the fire itself here. And the chairs here are rounded. Everything about it is like a tent overhead. And it's interesting, we know he's thinking in those terms because the only place we know that has quite this set of forms is a house he did for a woman he admired, named Mrs. Charles Dana. 
He remodeled her house in Springfield, Illinois, in 1902. Now, Mrs. Denner was a big woman in politics. She was powerful. He admired her. He thought she was wonderful. Now, look what he gives her. He gives her an arch like that, where you can't say, Romanesque, you say the quickening of life. And then in it, right there, he puts this column right in the body of the house. Now, that column is this piece of sculpture, which is carved by a man or modeled by a man named Richard Bocht, B-O-G-K, after a design by Wright. And Wright called it the flower in the crannied wall. And sometimes he called it architecture. Now you can see perfectly well it's a male phallus, basically. And it's quickening the female body of the house. Now I'm not making that up, because what he's doing very unconsciously is a very ancient pattern, which goes back to these patterns of the goddess of the earth on Malta. In the Neolithic period, we have the pre-Greek Demeter and Persephone in these uh, caverns dug out, built out of the ground, like this, with no outside, just the inside. And we know from the uh, statuettes that have been found in them that they're places of death and resurrection, death and rebirth. Little figures sleeping in here and then coming forth reborn, and in the head, here stands a shaft, which is that representation of that wonderful poetic line, tell me where is fancy bread, or in the heart or in the head. In the imagination, quickening of life comes there. And that's exactly what he's using. Now again, too, the other thing is, she's the only client of all his early work before World War I, where, whom he gives a, 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 a bio-vaulted room. And that's her dining room, again, the rounded closing it off. And the only other place he does it is in the playroom he adds to his own house for his own children in 1896, nurturing. And this one in 1896 is the first time he overtly uses verbal motifs as if here he, he rediscovers his own youth, right here. And the scale is wonderful. Maybe you can see it from the chairs. These are so low that a human being, uh, uh, an adult, can't stand upright. The children's scale. And we're up on an upper level, which they use as a stage. And they would describe, he was apparently a wonderful father, they'd describe how he'd be up there, naturally the center of attention, acting. And they're like, ah, like this. And so all like this, it comes down and he closes them. It's the only other place, absolutely the only other place he uses. Now he does use it, of course, in houses as entrances. Here's the, that's, it's out of focus, Dave. This, that's it, better, thank you. This is the Hurtley house in Oak Park, you see what he's got. He's got masonry, like Richardson just a few years before. This is 1902. There's Richardson in 1886 in Chicago in the Glessner House. There's the traditional box. There's the wonderful arch leading you in. You see the enclosed space. But now it's not like this, it's like a bridge. They're all taken apart and reconstituted, deconstructed. There's the big arch here, the thing next to it. But it's all continuous window up here. And as a matter of fact, this is all a uh, subsidiary play space, and the living area is up there in that space. So it's lifted away from the street, but it's got a gable. It doesn't open to the street. It's fortified against the street. It's secret. It's that nuclear family of frauds we're talking about. Not a, not a, a, a open public gesture. Here's another Richardson. It's a little more like it, this relationship of the arch to this and the continuity of windows in his Quincy Library here of 1882-83. But the real model is, again, English. This time it's Sir Ed Edwin Lutyens here in a house called Deanery Gardens in a place called Sonning. And you see what you've got? You've got the same thing. You've got the arched entrance. You've got the vertical pier here, the chimney next to it. You have the continuous window bands up above. And you have the hip roof. Now Wright takes it all. He pushes it down, he integrates it, and more than that, where the Foy's, where the Lutchens is on an English garden, wonderful, private and so on, by Gertrude Chico, he is right is on an American street. And here's the sidewalk, and his sidewalk doesn't go right to us, it goes like that. And right next to him are houses like this. Close the door, please. Right next to him are houses like this, like the type we saw in New Haven. Now see, here's the 19th century stick and shingle style, which still has a public sense. The house opens to the street. This, the, 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 the thing to the front door goes right in from the street. 
the gable confronts the street. This closes. It's like a secret. It's the family romance is all locked up in there, in the shadows. And it's really amazing. It's like a fort. And it's more than that, it's primitive. That's going into a house, you know, it's built of wood, got rooms in it. This is going into a cavern. Leads you to the side. You have to go here. This wall is masking the entrance. You pull in. It slowly pulls you in. And it's really pulling you into nature. And we're reminded of Richardson, you know, as he does it. But here it's more dynamic, the way these are hot, as if there's really an energy that goes through them. It's pulling you into it. And in that way, it's exactly like it's contemporary, more or less contemporary, Cezanne. In the late Cezanne here, of uh, rocks in the forest of Fontainebleau, you see how the rocks are grinding in these different colors and pulling you, and you're pulling into a natural shape. And out of this, of course, comes Wright's greatest house, which I'll talk about mostly next time, the Roby House, where in one period where it was being abandoned, you see the tree is growing exactly as it's growing in Cezanne between the image of the cavern down below, well, up above it opens like this into planes breaking out into space. And there the imagery is contemporary cubism like this, but most of all, the airplane, the two f opposites of cavern and airplane, the Freudian condensation of opposite things to make a new unity, which not only makes you, know, you feel that street, but comes sailing like an airplane toward the toward the campus of the University of Chicago, which is right there. And I'll talk about that next time. Thanks. If you, I hope you all got one of those uh, monuments lists, we call them. I don't know.